Right. Better you than me. <laughs> um, most providers are not taught about chronic genital symptoms. They're taught only about, um, about acute things. And usually they're only taught about infectious diseases and tumors. And that's it. So by the time someone is referred to me, uh, the patients have been told that this is yeast or bacterial vaginosis or yeast or a sexually transmitted disease or it's yeast. <laughs> and they've been treated for yeast and for all of these things and, and sexually transmitted diseases have basically been ruled out and they get to me because they didn't get better because it was none of these things. We don't know about men, but with women, almost one in five women gets a chronic genital disease causing itching or burning that's not diagnosed at some point in their life. One in five. And no one is taught to look after it. Dermatologists generally won't even look. Gynecologists are stuck with these diseases of yeast, BV, sexually transmitted disease, and no one wants to tell their middle class patient who's walked in that they might have a sexually transmitted disease. So they're stuck, and there are many things that can do it. Um, we do need to rule those things out. You don't want to miss syphilis. Besides, syphilis is wonderful. Penicillin, and you cure them. I'm also a dermatologist. Our patients never die, and they're never cured. So we just have to manage their issue. Somehow, patients don't see it that way when you tell them that they've got a sexually transmitted disease, however. But once you've ruled out yeast, once you've ruled out a sexually transmitted disease, let it go and move on. Um, okay, I'm going to first start up talking about normal variants because normal variants of the genitalia can be confusing and they can mimic sexually transmitted diseases. And the average provider doesn't pay attention unless a patient's having symptoms. Gynecologists especially, you know, they're headed into there to the cervix and to the uterus and to feel the, the ovaries, but they don't pay attention to the vulva or the vagina unless there's a problem. And women are the same way. Most of us don't look at ourselves very often. It's not easy. You need two hands to separate, one for the light, one for the mirror. And if you're, and if you're old, your arms get short and they won't get down there. So we don't know what we look like until we have a symptom. Oh, I like this. I like this, this group. Okay. Whereas the men look at themselves, they get to see themselves all the time. But that doesn't mean that they're paying attention either until something happens. Um, so a woman and a man is going to look when they feel something different. And they're gonna look down, and whatever see the, they see the day they look, they think it's new. Don't argue with them. <laughs> just, just say, oh yes, that can happen with this problem. I'm red, well, no, okay, that can happen with this problem, because you're not gonna win that argument. This is normal redness. People don't realize how red the skin can be. And if I had a long time, I would show you a whole bunch of vulvas of women with different skin types. A redhead can have skin that looks violaceous and scary red, whereas a darkly pigmented person of African uh, background may have one that's practically skin colored. And then there can be different colors of red because, I don't, I don't know, God had a bad hair day. And <laughs> it has nothing to do with their natural complexion. It's just that some people are red and some don't. Some people have got pink cheeks, and some people don't. But no one pays attention until there's a problem. Okay. Scrotum. Scrotums can be red. Scrotums can be very different one from another. Some are, are, are thin and smooth, some are thick and rugated. And um, one would think that a man would know what his scrotum looks like since it is their kind of out form to see. <laughs> but they may not pay attention until they start getting um, burning. And then we've got what we call red scrotum syndrome, which is basically neuropathy. Okay, four dye spots. 
you know, women, almost all premenopausal, postpubertal women will have these. They may be tiny and hard to see, or they may be big like this. But a woman hasn't paid attention until she reads in Cosmopolitan about genital warts. And then she looks, um, then she looks and she sees these and she freaks. These are kind of a yellowish, they're lobular. They are primarily on the medial aspect of the labia minora, but they can be other places as well. Here you can see these are, are grouped and uh, very large and look very different, but they're still that yellow color, and there are very few things that are yellow. So this is nice and normal. Sometimes they can coalesce into plaques, like you can see on the inside of this labia minus, or on the inside of that labium magus, they can line up in lines. So they can look very different one from another. And here's on a man, same thing. These are monomorphous, uh, and they don't look as uh, yellow because we're looking through uh, skin disease that it's harder to see colors through. But dome-shaped, monomorphous, normal. Vulvar papillae, and I know you've all seen vulvar papillae. Some people call these vestibular papillae because they very often are in the vestibule or the introitus, but they can be almost anywhere on the vulva. You can see that these are, oh, funny color. I like mine way better here. That's not, that's not what she looked like, and I've not been looking at these pictures. So, yeah, there. That's what it's supposed to look like. Okay. Thank you. This color is true. This color is not true. Red is normal, but not that red. All right. So these papillae have rounded tips. They're discrete all the way to the base, and they're bilaterally symmetrical. HPV infection usually has is either melted part way down, or they have acuminate spiky tips, or they're flat topped. But they're not. And they're not bilaterally symmetrical, and these are very soft. Either of these, either warts or these vulvar papillae, can um, can uh, uh, turn aceto white if you leave it if you leave acetic acid on there long enough. Here's another patient with these rounded tips, discrete all the way to the base, bilaterally symmetrical. Sometimes they will occur like here in lines. Here also, these are tiny and short, uh, right between the vestibule, which is mucous membrane, and the inner aspect of the labium minus, but these are all discrete to the base. They do not coalesce. They have rounded tips, and they are asymptomatic, and they mean nothing. They're supposed to be there. In people of darker color, sometimes they'll be pigmented, just like uh, uh, taste buds on the tongue, and darker pigmented people can sometimes be pigmented. That means nothing. This is all normal. Sometimes Women will have so many of these that they coalesce into this cobblestone appearance. That means nothing also. You can see up here where they're more discreet, but all over here, uh, this kind of cobblestone appearance. In the 80s, we thought this was subclinical HPV infection. That was before we had polymerase chain reaction technique to look, because a biopsy of the vulva especially uh, will have pseudocoilocytes, and you will sometimes get back uh, wart when there's no wart there. Pathologists are much smarter now than they used to be about that. Now here's the edge of a labium minus. You can see that this person even has these little papillae on the edge of a labium minus. So they don't have to be on mucous membranes. They don't have to be in the vestibule. This is the edge of the, the corona of the penis, and this person has pearly penile papules. Again, discrete to the base, rounded tips. These are usually in one to four rows and very, very common in uncircumcised men. It's just that we don't usually look that close. It's kind of hard to subtly look close at somebody who's not having a problem. But, but these are, are common. But once again, men don't notice them until their girlfriend or their partner has warts, and then they go start looking at themselves, and then they freak. But these are circumferentially all the way around the corona and symmetrical. And here's another. You can see why they're called pearly penile papules. Sometimes they are not on the edge of the corona, and they can be farther down even on the shaft. But classically, they're on the corona. Asymmetrical labia minora. Labia minora. 
the vulva, one vulva is as different from another as one face is. In Italy, in Turin, Italy, there's a work of art that's called the Great Wall of Vagina. <laughs> and it should be called the Great Wall of Vulva because people don't seem to understand the difference. It's not just our patients who don't know. It's just like the vagina monologue should have been the vulva monologue. <laughs> but that, that wall shows the huge, huge difference from one vulva to another. I mean, my patients walk in and I know all their faces. I don't necessarily remember their problems. That's why God made charts. I'll put them up in stirrups and I'll say, oh yeah, <laughs> that's who you are. So it's normal to have things be asymmetrical. So here's a woman who has got one uh, very small labia minus and one that's uh, more of a usual size. You can also see her four dice spots right here. And here's a woman who's got three labia minora on her right and one on her left. Not very uncommon. Well, three is kind of much. And here is an 11-year-old who you are probably aware um, although I wasn't until I really started looking, and I was a pediatrician, that little girls don't have labia minora. They start growing in when the estrogen kicks in. So at puberty, they develop labia minora. So this is a, an 11-year-old, and her right labia minus has gotten long enough that it's getting caught in her underwear, and it's uncomfortable, and she wants it gone. So I shortened it, and eight months later, the other one grew. So I learned my lesson. Wait until they're well through puberty so you can do it all at once in case. And then when estrogen goes away, everything changes. Oh, boy, isn't that the truth? Sorry. Um, on the vulva, it's more obviously visible. The labia minora shrink again, just like in baby girls. So you can't look at this for people who know a lot about vulvar disease and scarring. Oops, got to turn off my phone. Uh, for people who um, know about these scarring skin diseases where your labia minora go away, you can't count on that with an older person because the labia minora are going to go away anyway. This woman does not have any of the normal pink color. For pink color, you need some estrogen. That is really smooth skin. A healthy vulva and a healthy penis are bumpy and lumpy. They should have texture to, to them. They should not be shiny. They should not be smooth. They should not be very pale. And you can see that these, even though they're small, they're very puffy. This is the clitoral hood. It's very puffy. And the opening to the vagina has become contracted and inelastic. And you can see the anterior wall of the vagina there, which is also very pale. So this woman's she's got severe estrogen deficiency. Now, it doesn't matter if she's comfortable, but those are the signs. Okay, let's go on to some diseases that can look like sexually transmitted diseases. Here's a 26-year-old woman who was well until about four days ago. She developed fever, some malaise, some sore throat. Then she woke up with her vulva in pain and quickly developed ulcers. She tells you that she's been sexually active with a new boyfriend over the last month. Otherwise, she's well. She's got no underlying diseases. She's on no medications other than birth control pills. And you look at her, and here's what you see. You see this ulcer right here, and another ulcer, which is fairly large on the mucous membrane, and then you see these four dye spots down here. Okay? Everybody got that? So... Here's her quiz. Is this herpes? Is this a chancre of syphilis? Is this eczema? Or are these apathy? Who thinks herpes? Raise your hand. Who thinks a chancre? Raise your hand. Who thinks eczema? Raise your hand. Who thinks apathy? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to start polling you one by one since nobody's <laughs> playing my game. Okay. But I am impressed of those that were willing to play. You're right. These are apathy or canker sores, the same thing that people get in their mouth. And they're not rare, but they're rarely, they are rarely recognized. Why isn't it herpes? Well, because these are too big, too deep in a normal patient. Now, if you have an immunosuppressed patient, yeah, 
maybe. But in your average person, this is too big and too deep for herpes. A chancre, um, don't see very many chancres, but you can't count on that to get you out of that disease. These were very painful, and classically, chancres are not. And you weren't there. You can't tell from the picture, but these were very soft. They didn't have the firm edge of the usual chancre. But you still need to pay attention if this is the first time this woman has had this. Eczema. Eczema is a bacterial infection that uh, is severe and ulcerates. Um, this had very little surrounding redness. There was no purulence, uh, so this was not eczema. Apathy is the perfect history of a prodrome that seemed to be viral um, and with these discrete, fairly deep, very painful ulcers. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider the other things. But she does not need an extensive workup. She doesn't need biopsies. She's miserable enough as it is. But um, you can rule out those other things if you're concerned. The thing about sexual activity and a new partner, red herring. How many 26-year-olds are sexually active? Um, so let's talk about apathy for a few minutes because they are common. They are likely to end up in an infectious disease doctor or in a sexually transmitted disease clinic. Um, these occur most, here's, here's another child. You can see that she's just beginning to, to develop um, pubic hair. She's got a large area in her vestibule and then they come out coalescing ulcers on the um, labia majora, the hair bearing labia majora. Very painful. This is. Um, the white is necrotic skin that's wet. So necrotic skin, when it stays wet, is going to look white. And in the next few days, this is going to fall out and she's going to have deep ulcers. This is what apathy usually look like in the mouth. They're usually small in the mouth, but they can hurt like a, a lot. Um, <laughs> and then you don't usually see deep ulcers, but you can feel, you know, they really hurt. You go look in the mirror and you say, that's it, but on the vulva, they're much more likely to be large. The differential diagnosis for this, did I go, yep, I'm here. Okay, I want to talk about the difference between ulcers and erosions for just a minute because some classic sexually transmitted diseases like chancres and chancroid are ulcers and classic sexually transmitted disease of herpes is an erosion and they're in a different differential diagnosis. Most specialties don't talk about the difference, but this is pretty crucial to a dermatologist. An erosion is superficial. You run your finger over it, you can't feel it because only the epithelium is gone. An ulceration is deeper. It goes through the epidermis, into the dermis, and there's a drop off because it makes a hole. And here's a, a couple of examples. On your left are the erosions of erosive lichen planus. This person hurts, the top of the skin is gone, but you can't really feel a defect if you run your finger over it. On the right, there's a hole there. You know you're gonna feel that, and that's an advanced aphthous ulcer as well. This person has had chronic disease and has got scars from her old diseases as well as some uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation changes. More common or classic causes of erosions are herpes in an immunocompetent patient lichen planus, excoriations where somebody has rubbed and scratched because they've got eczema or another itchy problem. Uh, bad uh, candida will often erode. Somebody who has been treated for warts and may have had the area frozen or treated with trichloroacetic acid will cause erosions. Um, ulcers, there aren't many common causes of ulcers. Ulcers are uncommon in genital areas. Apathy is arguably the most common cause in immunocompetent people. Um, in an infectious disease clinic, I expect that herpes in an immunosuppressed patient is going to be the most common. Back in the early 90s, I had a, an HIV dermatology clinic. It was that common that people had such huge issues with HIV. It's wonderful to see, in that way at least, the way the world has changed. And if we saw an ulcer in that clinic, we knew it was going to be herpes in an immunosuppressed patient. So if you have a patient who's immunosuppressed, that's likely. Shankers and chancroid, those are classic causes, but you certainly don't see them very often. Overlap is common. If right now, for some reason, women are pouring witch hazel on their vulvas. 
So um, if a woman has got an erosion and she starts scrubbing at it, because we all know that cleanliness is next to godliness, <laughs> and she starts pouring alcohol and witch hazel on it, she can turn that erosion into an ulcer without half trying. Um, so manipulation, if they get a squamous cell carcinoma, like for patients with lichen uh, uh, planus, those can, um, can change an erosion into an ulcer. And certainly the first day or two of an ulcer, it's an erosion. And the last day or two is it's healing, it's an erosion. Back to apathy. These can be fairly common, especially in young girls. But we also see these in uncontrolled, severe HIV. Here was one of my favorite women. Um, she had HIV that was uncontrolled. And she has necrosed off the entire back of her right labium magus. Um, this area right here, this is all necrotic tissue that just hasn't fallen out yet. All of this white around the edge is resistant candidiasis in an immunosuppressed patient. Once she was treated for HIV, this all resolved and just melted away. Very often with apathy of the vulva, we don't see apathy in men very often. When it occurs, it's often on the scrotum but I have only seen one aphthous ulcer on the genitalia of a man in my life. And I've been doing this since 1981. So it's very uncommon in, women, in men, but pretty common in women, and extraordinarily common in the mouth. How many people here have had a canker sore? Yeah, I mean, it's just all the time. I would ask how many of you have had a genital aphthous ulcer, but that probably... <laughs> Somebody might not like that, <laughs> but it's uncommon. But I do see, I see it five or six times a year that women will have a genital aphthous ulcer. So it is definitely not rare. It's not usually recognized because these are going to, they're going to heal no matter what you do. They heal in about two to three weeks. And most women, they never get another one. So they're usually diagnosed with who knows, and then people forget all about it. Um, these women have, and girls, because it's usually the girls, between 9 and 18, have a history. They all have a history of oral apathy, but they, it's not in my office at the same time. You have to ask them, oh, yeah, I've had an aphthous ulcer in my mouth. Um, it's often uh, uh, precipitated by a virus infection. The classic is EBV, but it's not the only um, only a virus infection. It can be anything. And it doesn't have to be precipitated by a virus infection. It can just happen. Uh, for example, I had one young woman that every time she had a period, she would get an aphthous ulcer. So that's what precipitated hers. The diagnosis is usually clinical. If you have a 12-year-old who has one of these with the perfect prodrome, you don't have to do a big workup on her. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't think about these other things and about sexual abuse or that kind of thing, but this is a classic picture. So I'm going to show you some. They're not usually on this outside keratinized skin, but it can be. And th doesn't this look painful? Ah. And when it's not on wet skin, that necrotic skin can look black, this eschar here. Here's another. This is more common. This was actually the 14-year-old daughter of my vulvar nurse. She calls me on a Sunday night, and she says, oh, Libby, Abigail has developed one of those vulvar ulcers. What do you call them again? I said, apathy. She said, yeah, she had a sore throat last night, and she woke up this morning with vulvar pain, and now tonight she's got these ulcers. Can you call in some prednisone? And I got a case of wine from my pathologist because my pathologist called me. This always happens on a weekend. I've never seen that reported before. But it seems to always happen on a weekend. He called me on a Saturday afternoon. He said his 16-year-old daughter had a virus infection, and now she had vulvar ulcers, and he sent me a cell phone picture. And I said, these are apathy, and he sent me a case of wine. <laughs> um, but, but that's how common they are, that people that I cross in my life have children that, that develop these. Um, here again. And this poor child... 14-year-old had to be admitted for, with urinary retention, and she has necrosed off the back of her right labium minus. Okay. Another large ulceration here on the inner uh, posterior labium minus. Every once in a while, instead of having 
uh, two or three of these, there's a whole scattering of a bunch of fairly shallow ulcerations, and we call that a herpetiform pattern. Be careful about saying that in front of the patient or in front of the parents because herpetiform doesn't go over well. And it doesn't mean that it is herpes, it just means that it may be mistaken for it. So in these patients, you may especially want to do PCR of one of these and maybe cover with an anti -oral, oral antiviral. Here's another. So these are, are pretty, pretty characteristic. But be aware that oral and genital apathy does not make a diagnosis of Bechet syndrome. Bechet syndrome is oral and genital apathy that are large, frequently recurrent or chronic, and are associated with measurable other inflammatory disease. Vasculitis, uh, arth inflammatory arthritis, neurologic symptoms and signs, uh, uh, vasculitis of the eye, blindness, it's an awful, awful disease. It occurs primarily in men in the near and far east, but not in developed Western countries. When women get it, and it's almost always women in the Western countries, industrialized Western countries, uh, it is not the same disease. It is not nearly as severe. Um, they feel bad. They may get some mild vasculitis, but it is not uh, a, a, a disease with tremendous morbidity. So it's your job, if you see these people, to keep them from getting overdiagnosed with uh, Bechet syndrome. But if you have a patient with apathy, the first thing that you do is reassure them. The second thing you do is you treat their pain. And this is a time that we are allowed to give narcotics. Um, and then it's prednisone. This is prednisone deficiency. If it's a small person, you give them 40 milligrams a day. If it's a big patient, you give them 60 milligrams a day until the pain resolves. You often don't have to treat them until they've completely healed. But usually it's one to two weeks of prednisone. And then I give these people a prescription so that the next time they start getting ulcers, if they do, they will have it already filled and can start it and abort the attack. If patients have frequently recurrent attacks, then they need to be evaluated for low-grade bichettes with an eye examination, a good history, and suppression to keep them from getting recurrent disease. Dapsone, colchicine, some of the biologics, thalidomide, not a great thing for young women. And my young girl who had um, uh, uh, ulcers with menses, I put her on ongoing birth control pills so she didn't have menses. Okay, some other ulcers that can look like sexually transmitted disease. Here's one that is. This is a woman who had a renal transplant. She has herpes, and her herpes, instead of lasting for a week and going away, continues to grow and get bigger and deeper and ulcerate and burrow. So an immunosuppressed patient who has an ulcer, that's going to be the first and second thing that you think about. And you cannot tell by the morphology exactly what it is. Here's a, here's a man who has got, who's immunosuppressed, and he has had this going on for years, for years. This is what herpes should look like in an immunocompetent person. Uh, some small vesicles that break almost immediately and leave small erosion, some of whom coalesce. Here's a woman who um, is another organ transplant with an ulcer here and when, um, th that has just gotten bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. So how do you make this diagnosis? Well, of course, if it's an immunosuppressed patient, that's going to get your attention. It should be chronic and enlarging. These begin next to a mucous membrane of the lip, the lips north, uh, or mucous membrane of the genital area. Um, confirmation by PCR or maybe even a biopsy, and there's often in an immunosuppressed person a um, co-infection with cytomegalovirus. Here's a 38-year-old woman who's got a seven-month history of slowly, of slowly enlarging painful ulcers on the vulva. She also is sexually active, or she was until she got these ulcers. Not so much now. She's, uh, these ulcers have been resistant to penicillin. Her biopsies have been nonspecific, and otherwise she's healthy, except she has well-controlled rheumatoid arthritis that is not being treated because it's been in remission. And here's what you see. 
miserable. It's been going on for months, months. And this woman has pyoderma gangrenosum. Pyoderma gangrenosum, dermatologists love to name things according to what they look like, not what causes them. So pyoderma gangrenosum is neither a pyoderma nor is it gangrene, but it kind of looks that way. So this is sort of like vasculitis. This is a reaction to an underlying inflammatory process. And you can look at this biopsy and have a high index of suspicion that this is um, pyoderma gangrenosum because the edges are purple and the edges are overhanging. Here's another pyoderma gangrenosum. Edges are purple. This is where the inflammation is and they're overhanging. Now this is a reaction that can happen with inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, any chronic inflammatory disease. I've even had several patients with hidradenitis suppurativa who've developed this. But sometimes it just happens and you don't see an underlying cause. So just because they don't have an underlying cause doesn't mean that that's not what it is. So when you look at this, you need to consider the diagnosis of a, an, an infectious ulcer and do a biopsy and send tissue for cultures, unless they're a perfect setup for it. Usually these are on the leg. Purple edges, overhanging borders, getting bigger and bigger. And this is something that if you debride it, it will make it worse. These come up in areas of injury. That biopsy you're going to do to rule out uh, infection will make it worse. Here's another, overhanging edges, and you only see hyperpigmentation here, but that's because this person is darkly pigmented, so red really looks brown. The diagnosis is by the appearance and the setting. Hopefully they'll have an underlying cause, and if not, then a biopsy and cultures. It's a, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, and this responds to anti-inflammatories and immunomodulators. Prednisone is number one. Dapsone is often useful, otherwise TNF alpha blockers like infliximab or adalimumab. All right, this is last case. Um, this is a 20, we're moving on from ulcers now onto a, a different type of issue. 27 year old woman, she has a six month history of swelling and itching of her vulva and dyspareunia. She's been treated for yeast and bacterial infection over and over again. And she's been evalu uh, evaluated for herpes, for syphilis, and for gonorrhea. I'm not moving on from ulcers. I forgot about this one. Sorry about that. This is one of my favorites. Is long, And I've, I have seen three people with this in the last three weeks. And it's not that common, but it's common enough. Okay? This is Crohn's disease. This is one of the few conditions that there is no differential for. The only other thing that this could be is factitial, where somebody has cut themselves, because these are linear ulcers that go down skin lines. Um, a biopsy can be nonspecific. You can do a punch biopsy and not see the typical granulomas. Uh, there may be some smooth, some small, round, superficial ulcers or erosions as well, but not always. It's often in a setting of remarkable edema. They're often not that, that painful, not compared to these other things that we've been talking about. And eventually, they're associated with skin tags and perianal fistula and that sort of thing. Sometimes, there's a purulent vaginal discharge. Very often, there's a purulent vaginal discharge. You look at the discharge microscopically, and it is packed with white blood cells. Here's another patient this linear knife-like ulceration in a skin fold. Here are the round, more superficial erosions or small ulcerations. And I think you can see that there's quite a lot of edema here. Of course, the treatment for this is going to be referral to a gastroenterologist for systemic therapy. Here's the discharge. You look at her vulva, here's what you see. General redness. This, dis this uh, discharge right here is a little bit yellow. She's irritated and raw. You look at her discharge on your speculum, here's what you see. You look at her vagina, you see either diffuse redness or sometimes all of these little red macules that are classic for trichomonas when you see it on the cervix. 
but this is in on the um, in the vagina. And besides, even though it's classic for trichomonas, we know it's not always seen, and it's not. It can mean other things. If you look at the wet mount, you see sheets of neutrophils. You see parabasal cells, which are immature squamous epithelial cells. You see none of the good lactobacilli, and her pH is relatively high at seven. Here's what her wet mount looks like. So, last question. This could be trick gonorrhea, desquamative inflammatory vaginitis, or bacterial vag vaginosis. Um, which of these can it not be? Trichomonas, raise your hand. Could this be trick? Could this be gonorrhea? Could this be desquamative inflammatory vaginitis? Could this be bacterial vaginosis? It can't be bacteri bacterial vaginosis because bacterial vaginosis is not inflammatory. So you have to look, coming back here to make sure it's not trichomonas or gonorrhea. You do PCR, it's negative, and that leaves desquamative inflammatory vaginitis, whatever that is. <laughs> that is a red inflamed vagina that gives a purulent vaginal discharge, which then leaks out and burns the vulva. Um, other things that can cause inflammatory vaginitis are estrogen deficiency, erosive skin disease like lichen planus, leaving in a foreign body. The diagnosis is by this, um, this wet mount with white cells, parabasal cells, no lactobacilli, a relatively high pH, ruling out infection, normal estrogen, and no erosions. And the treatment is clindamycin cream, not because it's an infection, but clindamycin has anti-inflammatory effects. That's why we use it in teenagers with acne, because it has anti-inflammatory effects, or steroids in the vagina, or putting them both in there together. And when I do all of this, I give people fluconazole once a week to keep them from getting yeast. Once they're clear, you decrease the frequency to the lowest dosing that keeps them clear. So the take-home message from my lecture today is that there are many, many non-sexually transmitted diseases that can mimic, mimic STDs. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it.